Well, last time I talked, I think it was last year sometime, we talked about mercury, a uh, big controversy in the dental profession as well as in our mouths as well, and part of the devil's scheme to, uh, to uh, affect our minds and our emotions and uh, our general health. But today I want to talk about another controversy in the dental profession as well as in our mouths, and that is fluoride. <clears throat> now, we were taught in school that fluoride is safe enough to put in the water because it helps children's teeth. Uh, who doesn't want to help children? And um, <clears throat> this, we'll talk a little bit about the background of how that misconcept came to be. But first, we'll have just a little review of the, the chemistry of fluoride. And um, let me see if I can get this correct. Okay, well, I think I missed one there. Yeah, chemistry, um, uh, fluoride, is, it's, first of all, it's the most electronegative of all the elements. It has, um, I believe it's nine or ten electrons to share. That means it's going to react with almost anything that it's put, put close to. It'll have the, all these electrons that it will share. And this is one reason why it is um, <clears throat> not only uh, useful in the chemistry lab and pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical labs, but also why it uh, is so damaging in the body as well. <clears throat> it, well like I mentioned, it has nine electrons to share. It is attracted to calcium-rich tissue. <clears throat> and there was a time when physicians thought that uh, fluoride would really help osteoporosis, the uh, malady that many postmenopausal women have of getting weak and weaker bones, and the calcium seems to uh, be leaching out of the bones. So they started giving high doses of fluoride and then six months or a year later they would take x-rays of those bones and they would look like they're so much more dense. Wow, this must be good. But then those bones, they found out, were very brittle. They would break easily. And so um, <clears throat> even though the fluoride was being deposited in the bones as, as well as in the teeth, it was not making them stronger or healthier. And so um, <clears throat> much of the fluoride actually shows up in, in not just the teeth, but the bones as well. It, um, <clears throat> there was a physician um, who wrote a book back in 1937. He was uh, from uh, Stockholm, uh, from Sweden, Copenhagen. That's Denmark, isn't it? Um, yeah, anyway, he wrote a book in, in 1937, and you can go online and read that book today. I read several, quite a bit of it several years ago, and it's amazing the research that was done way back then showing how destructive uh, fluoride is to, to the body. <clears throat> he was one of the first key players, and also I have uh, uh, articles from the American Dental Association that shows that fluoride is a systemic toxin. And um, this was back in the 1930s as well. <clears throat> then there was a, another individual, but, well, let's, uh, we went a little too far there, Edward Bernays, the father of public relations. Okay, before we can um, go any further, let me just give a little history here. Um, <clears throat> What happened after the, uh, this research in the 1930s and 1940s showing how uh, damaging fluoride is in the human body, uh, the American public became um, hungry for a lot of the technology that was coming along, uh, like refrigeration and uh, um, carpet and um, as the war effort in the 1940s came along, we had to have a lot of aluminum for, for uh, making airplanes. And um, <clears throat> then another effort to uh, develop the atomic bomb came along. And all of these processes had one thing in common. 
they needed fluoride in the chemistry to, to develop the aluminum and, and actually steel as well. And <clears throat> so some of the, this was before the Environmental Protection Agency was formed as well. Some of these industries were being developed and in the process of making carpet and uh, refrigeration and <clears throat> um, aluminum and steel, they were putting tremendous volumes of fluoride compounds into the air. And there was one factory back in New Jersey that um, they found was destroying the, the crops within miles of this, of this uh, big factory. And people's health was being destroyed as well and, and they had all kinds of serious illnesses. Back in Oregon there was a lawsuit in the 1940s that, um, I can't remember which major manufacturer was, was involved, but they showed that this whole family within a mile of this plant uh, all had these horrible lung disease, this horrible lung disease, and um, they took a window pane from the kitchen window and showed it to the jurors in the in the courtroom, and this glass was etched by the fluoride compounds in the air, and that uh, they won that that uh, court case. I don't know what the settlement was, but I'm sure they needed medical care. And so the government became very concerned about this trend. And at the time, there were, uh, during World War II, there were 200 cases against these companies. And so they formed a, um, they knew one factor was that out in West Texas, there was a lot of fluoride in the water. And um, so they decided they would um, build on that knowledge and uh, they, they held, convened a big um, uh, conference on fluoride and there were some papers showing how damaging fluoride was and there were some papers showing how good it supposedly was and they only published the uh, ones showing the benefits of fluoride and um, <clears throat> then they convinced um, the director of the National Health Service to, to uh, because they showed that fluoride would help stop children's cavities, they, they said, uh, let's, um, we'll pass legislation approving it to put in the water so children won't have as many cavities. And this was done and immediately after that decision was made and announced, all of these 200 legal cases against these industries was thrown out of court. And um, <clears throat> then, then came along, well, then they decided they needed to make um, fluoride a little more acceptable. And so they, they got a man by the name of Edward Bernays. He is known as the father of public relations. He showed uh, people how you can sell anything if it's done properly. He had been used to, by the tobacco industry to make smoking um, acceptable smoking by women acceptable to the public. Um, at that time, men were the only people that smoked. And so they had these full page ads in the major magazines with uh, glamorous women with cigarettes in their hands, you know, uh, smoking. And so that began the trend of women smoking, which in greatly increased the sale of cigarettes. And, um, <clears throat> So people wanting to promote fluoride or make fluoride look safe, they hired him to do a campaign to, to do the same with fluoride, which, which he did. And uh, so, uh, if I'd had a little more time, I could show you some of the ads that he um, developed for that. Then one of the other players was Robert Kehoe, MD. He was a good guy but we won't take time to talk about him. There was another one, uh, though, Harold Hodge, MD. He was given, uh, he was the medical director of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was um, <clears throat> the government's um, push to, to develop the atomic bomb. 
and um, they intended, of course, to end the, the world war with it. But um, there was a lot of research going on, and Harold Hodge had an unlimited budget. And um, in the process of uh, developing the atom, they had to use a lot of uh, fluoride compounds. And this fluoride was, was very damaging. Uh, hundreds of people lost their health and many lost their lives working in the factory in, in Massachusetts that was um, kind of foremost in, in um, developing the, the atomic bomb. <clears throat> but um, Harold Hodge wanted to know just how damaging uh, these fluoride compounds are. And he was in Rochester, New York, in an office building uh, across from a, a big medical center. And he could go down the elevator to the basement and walk across the passage under the street, come up in the hospital. And he was, it's been documented that many times he would walk into a, an emergency room, someone in there wait, waiting to be seen or something. And um, in his doctor's coat, of course, he was a physician. He would go in and inject a patient randomly with some of these fluoride compounds. And then they would follow that patient in, in the hospital. Of course, they were soon hospitalized for, for all these um, bizarre things. And um, he would follow them and, and just see what the effects were in, uh, um, in that person's health. Um, <clears throat> then another, along came another lady. Um, well, let's see. One, Phyllis Mullinex. She's still alive today. I've heard her lecture many times. She was um, just completing her PhD. Uh, can't remember where it was, but um, <clears throat> she had developed a way of determining the toxicity of compounds by uh, the effect on rats. And she had been um, given quite a bit of notoriety because of of this process that she developed and as she completed this she was looking for a place to to work and do research and someone suggested that she uh, study um, the effects of fluoride and this was back in the 60s by then and uh, so she began studying fluoride and by this time Harold Hodge was an old man living in the area and he would come into her lab and uh, observe what she was doing and she was finding because of the behavior of these rats or, or mice with these fluoride compounds just all kinds of bizarre things and he would sit there and say yeah yeah I knew that you know I've known that for some time because he was seeing these same things that um, he had seen in humans in in the 40s and 50s but, um, and also another thing they did to make fluoride acceptable was they took five cities around the United States and um, decided they would, this was uh, when they were researching the fluoride in the water. And they, they um, fluoridated the water in those cities and they'd take another city nearby with the same population, a lot of the same dynamics, so they can compare them and they would not fluoridate the water there. And um, <clears throat> um, so they began following people and they had all these medical research uh, done of people in the, in the cities that were fluoridated and those that were not. And um, <clears throat> there's a physician that was practicing in one of the fluoridated cities in, on the East Coast and uh, she later wrote uh, her obs observation. And what they would do, they would take the data from both of the cities and it would go through Harold Hodge's office and he would distort and manipulate the data to make it look like the fluoridated cities, the p health of the people there was much better than those in the non-fluoridated areas. But this physician wrote her observation, it was totally the opposite. And it was, it was just horrible, uh, the effects of the fluoride in the water compared to what it, she had experienced before. But, um, and it's interesting because while I was in dental school, 
the year before I started dental school, I was working on my master's degree in public health, and I read all of this original research that had come through Harold Hodge's office, and I was an evangelist for fluoride. I mean, it, was, it is so um, convincing when you read that research. It's, it's got to be a, an essential nutrient that we all need every day uh, to have those kind of benefits. But um, imagine my embarrassment, you know, 20 years later when I, I read the book that uh, uncovered all of this information that that research was, was totally false. So Harold Hodge had tremendous amount of, of influence and Phyllis Mullinex, as she was completing her study effects of fluoride on uh, these, these rats, she had a um, conference uh, in, uh, Institute of Health, uh, NIH, and all of the major um, people doing research in health and all were there. And as she presented her research, which totally um, uncovered the falsity of, of the, the fluoride um, <clears throat> that had, had gone on, it was just totally dead silence. Nobody asked any question uh, at all. And um, <clears throat> it, was, it was quite uh, a convincing and overwhelming um, research that she had presented. And uh, strangely enough, the next day, she lost her job. And she was never able to, to find employment in industries. She continued researching with private grants and has and continues to lecture to this day. <clears throat> but um, this just gives you a little idea of what goes on behind the scenes. And it's actually a fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible says in Ephesians 4:14 4, to 16 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of applications of this, but um, I think we just need to realize that uh, we are living in a time when the devil is seeking to destroy the lives and health of everyone he can. And um, <clears throat> when you reach for that uh, tube of toothpaste and Walmart shelf that says fluoride uh, added, um, think about some of these other factors. That, thankfully, there are a lot of uh, uh, toothpaste now that are uh, fluoride free and fluoride is actually just one of the toxins in the major brands of, of, of toothpaste but uh, we won't go into that. I don't have a watch. Can someone tell me what the time is? Pardon? Ten more minutes. I'm sure there may be some questions you might have. Um, we Okay. Uh, Chris. What does fluoride do to you? Well, fluoride, uh, the reason it was shown to be helpful in the mouth is because it blocks the functions of many enzymes in the bacteria that can cause decay. But the problem is it does the same thing in our own enzymes. So it damages our enzymes. It, um, the, let me go back just a little bit. The reason why it looked like fluoride was causing um, uh, or inhibiting decay is because it was actually slowing down the development of six-year molars. And the studies that were showing decay were done on six uh, children who were six years of age, and they determined how many cavities they had in their six-year molars. Well, <clears throat> what happens, the fluoride actually slowed down the development of these teeth. And so the six-year molars were erupting much later. And so many children uh, that were um, drinking the fluoridated water um, 
didn't have six shear molars, so there was no no decay to report. And um, but you know, a year later, there would would have been a different picture. And so it's just uh, strange how how um, numbers can be manipulated. Uh, yes, in the back. So, how would you go about? finding clean water if you are going canvassing in a big city that you know has fluoride? Well, <clears throat> I, it's been so long since I've drank um, fluoridated water or city processed water with the chlorine and aluminum and all in it as well that uh, when I do have to drink some of that water I can actually taste these, these toxins. But I usually buy uh, spring water Purified water is a little benefit, but by law, purified water has to be only 10% better than what comes out of the tap. And so they um, just filter it a little bit and, and you, don't, you still get a lot of the toxins. So um, spring water is usually the best. Mm -hmm. Kevin. When you speak of fluoride, is that just a compound of fluorine uh, in, in toothpaste? I mean, right? That's, that's a good question, too. Um, <clears throat> because the fluoride that's naturally occurring in the water is um, um, calcium fluoride. And um, <clears throat> that's not what they're putting in the water. They're, what they're putting in the water is uh, fluorosalicylic acid, which is <clears throat> breaks down to silicone, and um, I can't remember the other the other product. But <clears throat> and the reason that was used because it's a byproduct of the phosphate fertilizer industry. Down in South Florida, there's huge industry that mines this stuff from the ground and making the phosphate fertilizers. <clears throat> and this um, highly toxic material was a byproduct. And they had warehouses full of barrels of this um, highly toxic chemical, which has never to this day been tested in humans. <clears throat> but it's kind of like evolution. You know, you add enough billions of years, it's supposed to make it credible. Well, you take enough, a small enough amount, then that's supposed to make it safe. And so they put uh, <clears throat> fluoride in the water at um, like one part per million. <clears throat> They've recently reduced that a little bit, eight tenths part per million, something like that. And the safe level is supposed to be from five tenths to 1.8 or something like that. But <clears throat> so they have a small amount and that's, and, and so, you know, about 20 years ago, all that huge reservoir of toxic stuff was used up. And then they began to um, import it from China as, as uh, um, because we ran out of our product. And here are these companies that would have spent millions of dollars of trying to get rid of this toxic stuff, instead sold it to cities to put in people's water. Okay, I think we have a question in the back there. What kind of toothpaste would you recommend? Okay, people ask me that almost every day. <clears throat> I usually tell them that I don't use toothpaste at all. And <laughs> if you have a favorite, you know, big industry you want to support, then that's, uh, you know, you're free to do that. But studies have sh shown many times over the years that toothpaste does not have any effect on cavities or gum disease. And what is effective is the physical action of the brush against the tooth in disrupting the sticky plaque, and then you rinse that off and, and your gums can be healthy even without toothpaste. The reason toothpaste is helpful for children, it's been assumed, is because it tastes good and makes brushing more pleasant, and so they'll they'll uh, want to brush more. But um, yeah, you can have healthy teeth and gums without toothpaste. Okay, one question here and then we'll go to... That's all right. 
So whenever I go to the dentist, every time they go and clean my teeth, they always like at the end, they always put this one thing. I think that it's fluoride. If I'm not mistaken, it's fluoride. And they put it and they're like, you can't eat for like 30 minutes. So is that mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. not it's, healthy? It's toxic. It's toxic? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so, you, so is it like a choice Like you can tell them not there to There is some it? benefit uh, topically that makes the teeth a little harder. Do you harder, use that? No. You don't use that? No. I, when I started practicing 42 years ago, I used fluoride for maybe one year, two years, and after a child threw up all over, I decided I don't need to do that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but, uh, also, so. um, I'm asking for a friend, um, what do white strips do to your teeth? White strips um, bleach your teeth a little bit, and they're, 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 not they're safe. Okay. I don't, it's not fluoride. <laughs> Okay, in the back. Is it um? Is this like? Is it safe to drink tap water here in Clark County? <laughs> well, thankfully, at this point, Amity doesn't have fluoride in Amity water, <clears throat> which is sold to Alpine Rural Water Association, and we we buy our water from <clears throat> Alpine Rural Water Association, and it is not fluoridated. It does have chlorine and aluminum in it, but no fluoride. That doesn't sound safe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, can osmosis filters filter out fluoride if it's in a city water? Reverse osmosis does filter, filter out the fluoride. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you said also that you prefer spring water like buying. What about distilled water? Distilled water? Um, it's, it shouldn't have fluoride in it either, but um, okay. yeah, it won't have the, some of the minerals and things that Jose? Um, so how can you know if water has fluoride in it or not, or tap water, I mean? Well, you'd have to call the um, water system that's producing it. Mm -hmm. I had a patient years ago, just as one quick story. Um, are we out of time? Okay. I had a patient years ago who was working for the Kimsey Water uh, Treatment Facility over in Bismarck, and they're supplying water to rural areas south of Hot Springs and clear over to Glenwood and uh, just a large area, Bonnerdale and, and all. <clears throat> and this man had been on vacation for a while. He came back to work and they said, oh, there's a problem down there with the fluor fluoride um, equipment and go see if you can fix it. And so as he was down there tinkering with it or something, a uh, uh, line popped off and sprayed him with this concentrated fluoride product and um, all over his arm and everything. And, and um, <clears throat> within minutes, he was in the emergency. I mean, they, he was really deathly ill. And um, because, you know, he had been told it was safe. It's good for children. But they should have had a shower there. He should have immediately showered all this stuff off, but he didn't. And this destroyed his health. When I saw him, we ended up having to pull all of his teeth. He'd, he'd spent thousands of dollars with crowns on almost all of his teeth, and all of those, uh, his teeth and gums were just destroyed, and we had to make dentures for him. And he was constantly, had so much pain, he was constantly on these, um, I forget what it was, uh, <clears throat> pain medication, sucker type things he had to uh, keep in his system all the time. But it, um, and uh, they even refused to give him unemployment. I mean disability because it, it just ruined his health. He wasn't able to do anything after that. Anyway, uh, one more question. With um, so with toothpaste, is would it still be beneficial to use toothpaste like like I use the Hello charcoal toothpaste? Mm -hmm. um, if using toothpaste doesn't have as much of a benefit, is there still a benefit in using something like that or just brushing with water? What would you recommend? Uh, yeah, there's there's a little benefit, but if it's more pleasant and makes you enjoy, helps you enjoy brushing your teeth more, I you know I wouldn't discourage you from using. It. In fact, we had a patient um, tell us about a new type of herbal toothpaste. We had one we sold for years called Tooth and Gum, but a new one, Revitalin, I think it is. And so we ordered it from them. And when I saw it come in, I thought, oh, let me try that. So I took the tube and took it home and, and tried it. And really nice fl uh, flavor and I really like the list of ingredients but then uh, we had to order some more when I found out that was for a sp specific patient <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah there are some um, there are some really good 
good products and tasty and, and uh, much healthier for you. Yes. Here again, Mrs. Clark. Oh. Okay. Um, what you said sounds almost like a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. Would you explain a little bit about the declassification of information that helped did that, and also about hip fractures in fluoridated city? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Um, the reason I was so naive for, for many years, several decades, <clears throat> was because this information of, about Harold Hodge and others um, was totally unknown. It had been covered up. In fact, some research done at Kettering um, back in the 40s and the relationship with uh, studying fluoride and the effect of the uh, lungs of dogs was totally buried and um, but while Bill Clinton was president and this is one positive thing he did um, <clears throat> he declassified the documents of the 40s and, and 50s these era back there and so an investigative reporter by the name of Christopher Bryson was able to go back and do research and uncover all of this information. And <clears throat> one of my patients who single-handedly basically had defeated fluoride issue in the city of Hot Springs back in the 60s or 70s, I guess, uh, she couldn't go to any dentist in Hot Springs because they all hated her. And so um, she found me and started coming to me and started dropping these little tidbits about fluoride and of course I was you know just a, an evangelist in favor of fluoride and but when Christopher Bryson's book was published she bought a copy and gave it to me and I started reading that book and I had a hard time putting it down my wife, my family were so upset with me because I kept sharing it with them but <laughs> they um, uh, the, a third of, of this book is the documents of where he found the information. And as a history major, that was important to me because I don't want to accept just anybody's uh, I, uh, word about something. But a very well written book, and one chapter actually occurred here in Arkansas. And I remember seeing the details and uh, some of the details in the headlines of the newspaper back then but it was totally different what I was reading than what was actually going on. But um, <clears throat> so that's, that's how we, we know where we, uh, we know what we know today. And as far as hip fractures, yeah, they, um, the, uh, instead of being stronger, the, you can take the data that's published by the CDC of the incidence of diseases of all kinds in different parts of the country. Now about 60 or maybe 80 percent of the um, major cities in our country are fluoridated, so it's, it's hard to find uh, the controls. But when it was just developing maybe 20 years ago, there were many cities that were not fluoridated, and you can compare the, the incidence of hip fractures, say, or wrist fractures or whatever, and it was much, much greater hip fractures in cities that were fluoridated. And <clears throat> there was another lady doing research for her PhD showed that the um, incidence of bone cancer in boys eight to 10 years of age was five times greater in fluoridated cities than non-fluoridated cities. So, uh, I don't know about you, but I've had relatives who, with children who died of bone cancer, uh, eight to eight to twelve years of age. So, it's you know it's it's uh, affects a lot of people. Okay, well you've been a good audience this morning. Sorry for not being better organized, but um, let's uh, kneel as we close. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of living in these last days when we can see so many areas of controversy between good and evil. We pray that we might uh, take the information that, we, that has been revealed and to build um, not only healthy bodies but have healthy minds as well, that we might be prepared for the uh, 
final conflict soon to come. In Jesus' name we pray and ask your blessings throughout this day. Amen.